Minnesota has a growing public health problem. Although medical personnel and the public recognize Lyme disease by name, few truly understand the illness. MLA is working to change this. The Minnesota Lyme Association, or MLA, is an all-volunteer organization. Our mission is twofold, to provide a supportive environment for people affected by tick-borne illnesses and to educate the public and health professionals about these diseases. MLA provides continuing medical education programs, establishes patient support groups, organizes forums, and provides educational materials to the public. Lyme disease is a bacterial infection caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, shown here. The bacteria can invade any part of the body, but most commonly infects the skin, joints, and nervous system. Lyme has two main stages. In early disease, the bacteria remain in the skin, and in erythema migrans or EM rash may develop at the bite site. The easily recognized bullseye rash accounts for less than 20% of all EM rashes. Solid colored oval rashes like this one make up the remaining 80%. CDC statistics document that 30% of patients have no rash. Later, the bacteria leaves the skin to infect other tissues. While this woman appears to have Bell's palsy, she actually has Lyme disease affecting her facial nerve. On the far right is a picture of Lyme arthritis. Lyme disease is spread by deer ticks. When deer ticks feed on Lyme infected animals, they pick up the bacteria and during subsequent feedings, they pass it on. This magnified view of an adult female shows the characteristic black cape and reddish brown body. Last year, half the ticks collected in the seven county metro by Metropolitan Mosquito Control District personnel were deer ticks. The second photo shows the different deer tick stages, adult female, adult male, nymph, and larva, and gives a perspective on their size. Because deer ticks are so small and their bites painless, it's not surprising that most people with Lyme disease never knew they were bitten. Lyme disease isn't always easy to diagnose. Symptoms change throughout the illness. They may come and go or be severe one day and mild the next. When infections go untreated, additional symptoms usually develop. Lyme patients don't all look the same. The types of symptoms and their severity differ from one patient to the next. Many symptoms of Lyme disease are also seen in other illnesses, making it difficult to distinguish Lyme from other diseases. If deer tick exposure isn't considered, especially in situations where there's no history of a bite or EM rash, doctors may not recognize that Lyme disease is a possible diagnosis. Under these circumstances, doctors use lab tests to help sort things out. Unfortunately, results from Lyme disease tests aren't always reliable. The problem may be one of timing, with people tested too early or too late in their disease. The tests themselves may be a problem. Studies have shown that results are often unreproducible, meaning they vary from lab to lab. Defining what constitutes a positive result is another factor. The CDC testing strategy that most labs follow was developed to identify a specific subset of patients, not all Lyme patients. The epidemiologists who outlined the criteria stated their definition wasn't intended for clinical use. Given these facts, positive results support a Lyme diagnosis, but negative results do not rule it out. Actual cases of Lyme disease have been missed because few doctors are aware of this principle. Because the infection is bacterial, Antibiotics are always required. Treatment works best in early disease, but some patients will develop long-term problems. When the infection goes unchecked for long periods of time, particularly if the nervous system is involved, few are cured. No one knows why treatment fails, and there are several possible causes. We do know that some people have persistent infections, and there is ample scientific evidence of the bacteria surviving common antibiotic protocols. And, although many doctors don't know this, 
two NIH-funded studies demonstrated that some patients improved significantly when they were retreated with antibiotics. Lyme disease is an important public health issue in Minnesota. The state ranks in the top 10 for reported cases and our numbers increased by 18% in the last five years. Deer ticks transmit other infections and Minnesotans are at risk for all of these co-infections. Most residents may be unfamiliar with anaplasmosis, babesiosis, and bartonellosis, but not for long. This map by the Minnesota Department of Health depicts the risk of Lyme or anaplasmosis by county. The darker the color, the higher the risk. As you can see, the majority of the state, including popular vacation destinations and summer camps, is at high risk. Cases are reported by county of residence and may not reflect where an infection originated. The belief that metro residents must have acquired their illness elsewhere is mistaken. A recent Metropolitan Mosquito Control District report noted that deer ticks are consistently found in many metro locations and are showing up in new locales. The report concluded that the risk of acquiring Lyme disease in the metro is higher than it's ever been. The CDC usually emphasizes the data regarding reportable cases of Lyme disease, but because the surveillance case definition uses strict criteria, most cases do not qualify for reporting, which means that case numbers are artificially low. In 2013, the CDC changed its focus. It's now clear that reported cases are just the tip of the iceberg. Rather than 30,000 cases, the CDC now estimates that more than 300,000 new cases of Lyme disease occur each year. Extrapolating to our state, annually some 15,000 Minnesotans will become infected. Lyme disease is not a trivial illness. Although many patients need just a single course of antibiotics, for others the infection is physically disabling and financially devastating. A national survey of Lyme patients found that 65% of the respondents had to reduce the hours they spent at school or to work, and a quarter of them qualified for disability payments. Many Minnesotans lead the state to access innovative treatment protocols. Costs vary by disease stage and severity. A CDC analysis, based on the value of the dollar in 2000, found that the average case of late Lyme disease cost over $16,000 per patient. Many questions regarding the diagnosis and treatment of Lyme disease are unsettled, leading to vigorous medical debates. Some state medical boards discourage their physicians from pursuing innovative antibiotic regimens. Although the Minnesota Board of Medical Practice never did this, local patients worried about that possibility. In 2010, the board adopted a five-year moratorium on investigating or disciplining physicians who prescribed long-term antibiotic treatment for Lyme disease. This allayed the patient concerns. Patients are the primary beneficiaries of the moratorium because it expands their access to care. Established physicians are taking on additional patients and new physicians have begun caring for this growing patient population. As these doctors pursue the use of scientifically based innovative therapies, they are better able to tailor treatment to an individual's needs and goals thereby providing the individualized patient-centered care that the Institute of Medicine encourages. No definitive studies have been published since the moratorium was enacted, but a 2013 study documented that many who were treated early had persistent symptoms and studies in primates and humans provided more evidence of persistent infection. Because much remains unknown, it is unwise to prematurely prohibit potentially curative treatment. Until definitive studies can provide answers, it is MLA's position that the needs of Minnesota patients would be best served by continuing the current moratorium. Elected officials can positively influence the management of Lyme disease in Minnesota 
and indirectly improve the lives of their constituents. Officials would learn much by listening to fellow citizens describe the hurdles that made it difficult to treat their illness. The growing risk of tick-borne diseases requires coordinated community-based strategies that increase the public's awareness of tick-borne illnesses and promote effective disease prevention. Elected officials are in a position to ensure that such programs are created and implemented. Research funding is also needed. Legislators can allocate money specifically for Lyme disease. Preserving patient access to innovative, patient-centered care is crucial to improving outcomes, and officials should support this basic patient right. Clearly, elected officials can do much to improve Lyme disease prevention and care in Minnesota. MLA and its members are ready to help. Get to know us by visiting our website, talking to our members, or asking questions of our board. MLA is dedicated to preventing tick-borne illnesses and to assisting patients who are seeking evidence-based, patient-centered medical care. Thank you for watching this slideshow. We hope it gave you insights into some of the Lyme-related issues our fellow Minnesotans face. We thank you in advance for your support and efforts towards reducing the burden of Lyme disease in Minnesota. And for all that you do to preserve and improve the quality of life here, we thank you. To learn more, contact us at www.mnlime.org. Thanks again.